few moments. So if you're with us at home tonight, I would encourage you to get some crackers, some juice, and uh, any kind of juice, any kind of bread or cracker, and uh, we'll partake of communion together after the have an opportunity to look into the Word of God. And tonight I'm going to continue along the lines of what Pastor Tim Delina, our senior pastor at Times Square Church, spoke on Sunday morning. He spoke on a new season. Um, God's kingdom is always moving forward, always uh, heading. The, the easiest way I can explain it to you from the time that the, the first church came out of that upper room on the day of Pentecost and moved into the marketplace, we have been moving as a people, constantly moving and ultimately culminating with Christ coming to bring us home to be with him again forever. And along the journey, he is leading us, he is speaking to our hearts, and we are gathering a harvest for him as God's people. This is what the church is, this is who the church is, this is what we're called to do. His voice is the only voice that should be leading his people, should be leading you and should be leading me so I'm going to share a message tonight just simply called, Hear Him. Now it's about prayer, so we're going to finish with prayer at the end, but it's called Hear Him, Matthew chapter 17. If you have a Bible or device that you can follow along, that would be much appreciated. So Father, thank you, God, tonight for this opportunity one more time to open your word before your people. Father, in Jesus' name, give us ears to hear. Amen. Lord, we have been led by so many voices, especially in this nation called America, for so many years. God, much of what has purported to be your kingdom has come from the minds and the thoughts of men, not from the mind of God. Help us, Lord, to abandon these old ways of doing things. Help us, my God, to hear you, Give us the grace to come to nothing so that you could become everything. Guide us, guard us, lead us. Have mercy on your church, Lord Jesus. Father, I'm reading tonight prayer requests from around the world and your bride is bruised and beaten and mocked and tormented. God Almighty, it's heartbreaking. Lord, I know as a man, I would not stand by and watch somebody beat my wife on the street corner. And how much more, Lord, will you rise to defend your church? How much more, God, will you rise and give healing in our homes, to our teenagers, to our marriages, to our families, God, to the pulpits across the nation? We appeal to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We appeal to you from the very center of our heart tonight. Bring healing to your church. Bring healing to your body. Help us, Lord, again, not to lean on our own ways, but in all ways to acknowledge you and you promised that you would direct our paths. So direct us. Thank you, God, for giving us a pastor at Times Square Church that seeks you. Thank you, Lord, that he wants to hear your voice and is being guided by your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we are eternally grateful for you providing us with a man of God like this. We give you the praise and the glory. Tonight, Lord, God Almighty, stretch out your hand and heal. Stretch out your hand, God. Heal sick in minds and bodies and homes and marriages and families. Give people tonight a reason to live. I think of Angel tonight who wrote and texted in, said, I have no reason anymore to be good or to live. God have mercy on this young lady. God have mercy on the family whose teenage boy hung himself in New York this week. Have mercy, Lord, on the marriages that are falling apart, pastors that are substance addicted, have mercy on your church, Lord. Give us the ears to hear and the grace to follow. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Now we're, we're looking at a spiritual experience probably unparalleled in a sense to anybody of their generation. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, 
one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. Here you see humanness and divinity meeting together on a mountain where God's about to do something that is absolutely powerful, it's phenomenal, and Peter in his humanness, it's true, it's true in our humanness, we'll always gravitate to present or past experience for our sense of comfort and well-being. He's, <laughs> Peter was the kind of a man that said, hey, it just doesn't get any better than this. I mean, this is awesome. We have the Son of God here, we have Moses, we have Elijah uh, representing, of course, the law and the prophets being fulfilled in one sense, in Christ, we have the presence of God, the transfiguration. Uh, we're alone with God. We're on a mountaintop. We don't have to deal with the people that are all around us. This is a great place to just camp and let's stay here forever. That is the human condition. That's what we, you and I, always want to do. We always want to, first of all, we want to declare something uh, to be good uh, as equal or better than the best. In other words, uh, you remember in Genesis chapter three, and verse five, the temptation of Satan was that you can be as God is or as, as judges, it says in the original King James, and you can be the arbiters in the sense of what is good and what is evil. And so we have this propensity when God's trying to show us something to jump in and make a declaration of something that we think is good and in our humanness, we always want to camp in a certain place. That's why churches that have known revival generally died. You know that. I mean, are you even aware of that? You look out through history. Great, great revivals have happened. I, I'm talking about real revival, not, not a lot of the stuff that's gone on maybe in some places over the years, but real revival where people are coming in, they're turning to God, they're repenting. The glory of the Lord is, is in the actual physical bu building. And you go back there, uh, a few years later, and you, you have the same people trying to relive the same experiences uh, of three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. I, I had the privilege of, of preaching in Wales uh, in one of the buildings that uh, was uh, significant in the, in the Welsh revival in 1904. And, and I remember that like, people are still sitting there waiting for the Welsh revival to happen again, uh, you know, over two, over a hundred years later. And, and they've not moved in the church. There's a dullness there because they've not really moved on with God where God is moving. It's a danger that we all face. Times Square Church has had a great history. For example, we've had 33 years of, of a marvelous history. I, I, I mean, a prophetic voice was raised up of God to uh, to found the church. The church was founded on a, on a word that, is, uh, that was given to David Wilkerson that's, that's rarely heard uh, in many generations, uh, a prophetic word and, and incidences that actually came true that were spoken to his heart. And it, the glory of the Lord, I've been there for 26 years. I know the, uh, of the 33 years, the, the glory of the Lord has, has been there. I remember one service I, before I came to New York City David Wilkerson told me the glory of the Lord came so strongly into that sanctuary that people were on their faces on the platform. They, 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 couldn't, they couldn't stand up in the presence of God. Now that's amazing. That's wonderful. But that happened yesterday. We are now living in today. And thank God for those experiences. And, and, and what it should do is it should spur us on to say, Lord, we're Wherever you are going, because you, you do pass through at moments, but wherever you're going, I'm going with you, we're going with you, because that's where life is. We can't camp on the mountain of past experience uh, because God's not going to stay there. You could, you could just imagine Peter, James, and John would have been left on a mountain with their own tents. That's about all that would have happened, and Jesus would be long gone because he was on a mission. And we can choose to camp on our past experiences, and quite often that's that's what we do. Our tendency is to jump in and declare something to be good and say, we're going to camp here. We're going to stay here. We're, we're going to revel in this. This is going to become our identity from this day forward. And while Peter is speaking, it says in verse five, while he was still speaking. So here is, here is Peter representing humanity making declarations about what is good, and this is, God is here, and everything he's seeing actually is good, but it's not, it's not complete. It's not where God is leading. It's not what God is speaking. 
while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Now, this is not being said for the benefit of Moses or Elijah or Jesus. This is being said for the benefit of Peter, James, and John. May I put it bluntly? God is telling these men, stop speaking and start listening to the Son of God. He is going to lead you somewhere. Your opinions in the kingdom of God don't matter. Your opinions don't produce life. Your opinions don't lead into the supernatural. Your opinions don't bring about deliverance to people who are hurting at the base of this mountain, for example. Your opinions are worth nothing. And all you can build is something that will ultimately become irrelevant if you're not willing to walk with the Son of God. That's why many churches that have known great movings of God in the past are now irrelevant today. Go to New York City. You'll find great stone buildings all over the place that are now just museums. They're empty. And when you walk into them, you say, surely something must have been here at some time because people put a lot of time, energy, money into the building of these buildings, yet there's nobody left here anymore. What happened to these people? I want to suggest that they, to you that they camped in their building. I want to suggest to you they camped on their past experience and talked about back in 18 so-and-so when brother so-and-so preached here. In some of these places, Charles Finney preached. I'm so thankful for that, but he's dead. He's gone now. There's new, the, the voice of God is still alive. Charles Finney is dead. And we've got to move with the voice of God, not with what somebody spoke uh, hundreds of years ago in the past. It's time for us to stop listening to our own voices and listen to the one who's been sent to lead us. Now, Christ came to seek and save that which was lost. And he calls you and I to follow him and not to spend our full time seeking personal revelation, comfort, and spiritual experience. There's a whole segment of the church today, folks. That's all they do. They just run from place to place to place to place, just seeking revelation, seek, ultimately seeking personal comfort and seeking some new experience and just run around talking about, you know, the, the tinglies that they had in the last meeting they attended in the last country they went to. And the whole pursuit is, is a mount of transfiguration. They want to camp there. They want to stay there. They want that to be their whole per, uh, spiritual experience. But you see, the revelation of who Jesus Christ is begins to lead us to what he does. You see, there's a two parts to this. The transfiguration was there. They spoke of his decease. It tells us in other places that he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem, that through Christ, everything that was prefigured through the law and the prophets was about to be fulfilled at the cross. A church was going to be born. This church was going to go in, into all of the world. And this wonderful message of salvation through Jesus Christ was going to be preached to everyone who had the ears to hear. Now, he was leading them somewhere, but they were so engrossed in their own ideas of what spiritual experience leads to that they couldn't hear him yet. And it's like God had to override the whole thing, quiet Peter down and say to Peter, basically, and James and John, this is my son, hear him, hear him. Your voices don't matter. Your plans will come to nothing. Your strategies will not build this kingdom that you can't even see with your natural eye. Hear him. He is the captain of the Lord's army. He is the one who appeared to Joshua and told him, take off your shoes. In other words, I don't want your plans. I don't want your strength. I don't need your ideas. I need your obedience. And even if my plan to you seems to be ridiculous, follow it and you watch what will happen. I mean, you talk about a, a ridiculous military strategy. March around uh, a walled city seven days and just say nothing. I mean, it's just, a, I love it. In the, in the reality of it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a, a, a prefiguring of what happened here on the Mount of Transfiguration where God is saying, I don't talk because the moment you do, you will destroy the plan of God. The plan of God is for you to just walk around in confidence, blow the trumpets, and when I tell you, shout. And when you shout, you're going to see what God can do. He was leading them to a place, but they couldn't fully hear it yet. Now, the question arises, why couldn't they fully hear him 
And what is it that causes you or me to not be able to fully hear the voice of God? I don't know about you. I, I really, <laughs> I hope you're as I am, but I want to hear his voice more every day. I, I want him to lead me. It, it's easy to come up with ideas. And the more experience you have, the more ideas you have. And, but the kingdom of God's not built by men's ideas. It never has been, and it never will be. Like, tabernacles will be erected. Tents will be made. And people will talk about what happened somewhere, sometime to somebody. And it will always be about the past, never about the, the future. Never. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. But if you ever traveled to places where the church literally died, and the people may still come into the building, but their whole conversation is going to be about yesterday, what God did yesterday, and through whom he did something yesterday. They have absolutely no vision for the future because they're no longer listening to the voice of the Son of God. That's why the Father said, this is my Son, hear him, hear him. He, all through the book of Revelation, to every church, you, you'll notice, he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit speaks to the churches. I want hearing ears. I want God to lead my life. I've had a wonderful past. I really have. It's been a, a miraculous journey. If, if you ever got a copy of the book, It's Time to Pray, you'll see that. It's been a, an amazing journey in my life. But, and I don't know how long I've got left on this earth, but I want to live it for Him. And God is not interested in my, I have a lot of ideas, obviously. After, after years of experience and walking with God, you have a lot of ideas. But the one thing I have learned is that if he's not leading, there's no power in it. What God does not initiate, he does not sustain. It's, sim it's, quite, it's, it's simple. If he's leading, the supernatural will always follow it. If he's not leading, if it's just a good idea, then we're on our own with our own little tabernacle on the top of the mountain talking about our past spiritual experiences. We can't often hear him. They couldn't hear him and we can't hear him yet because in Peter's case and the disciples, they were still leaning on their own strength and their own understanding. Jesus was trying to speak to Peter, but Peter was not listening yet. You remember in the scriptures, he told Peter, <laughs> where I'm going, you can't follow me now. What was Peter's response? Oh, yes, I will follow you. Oh, yes. And, and if you go to Jerusalem to die, I'm going to die with you. And these others here, they may not have the courage to go, but I will not turn back and I will not do this and I will not do that. He's just full of himself. He's full of his own ideas. He's full of his own strength. Jesus is trying to speak to him and say to him, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to three times deny that you even know me. Now, he can't hear it because he's still relying on his own strength. And he doesn't understand that where Christ is leading, we can't follow without his strength. There's a lot we can do without the strength of God, but where he's leading, we can't go without his strength. I've been around long enough to know this, this truth. There's a wonderful truth that I've espoused a few times over the years, and it's just simply said in a simple statement, the end of ourselves is the beginning of God. God had to bring Peter to an end of himself. He had to bring him to a place where he had nothing left to say. He had denied, all he could do is weep bitterly because he had, all his ideas came to nothing, all his, his trust in himself came to nothing, all of his boasting and bragging of all the things he was going to do and accomplish and how loyal he was going to be to the kingdom of God and all the ability he said he had that he doesn't possess. Finally, it came to an end. And what came to an end, he could start to hear now the voice of the Son of God. This is my word to you, many who are out there and you're struggling and you're suffering and, and you've come to the end of your, your testimony would be tonight, I've come to the end of myself. Well, the good news for you is the end of you is the beginning of God now. Now your ideas have come to nothing. You've run into the brick wall that all humanity runs into when they try to follow God in their own strength. Now you're willing and ready to be trained. Now you're willing and ready to hear and to follow where God is leading you. Remember, it's not in our strength the kingdom of God advances. It's in our weakness 
with his strength manifested through our weakness. Paul the Apostle said it this way, when I'm weak, then I am strong. He understood it. The second reason why we find it hard to hear the voice of the Son of God is because we are unwilling in many cases to put away old things and to embrace that which is new. You remember, if anyone was in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. So God is not just taking us out of where we used to be, but he's bringing us into where you would have us to go. The spirit of God comes into our life according to Jesus in the Gospel of John, and he shows us things to come. He starts speaking to us about what he has for us, not what we have for him. There's a huge difference. You know, in, in our humanity, we, we will make promises to God that we can't fulfill. And finally, when we come to an end of that, suddenly God starts making promises to us. And it's by these promises that we begin to live and we become everything that God has called us to be. But there's got to be a willingness to put old things away. Pastor Tim spoke about that on Sunday morning, for example. Old comforts need to be put away. Old experiences. Yes, we can remember them, but we don't camp there. We don't live there. In other words, we, we say goodbye to it. It's, it. It was great. It was a wonderful time. Thank God for that time, but it's over. We've got to move on now to where God is leading us. Old friends have to be put away. A lot of people want the kingdom of God, but they want their old friends at the same time. Remember the children of Israel? They came out of Egypt and, and they, they suddenly in the wilderness started remembering the, the leeks and the garlic. Can you imagine? Oh, we remember the leeks, remember the garlic. Did they forget the children were being thrown in the river there? Did they forget the, that they cried out in their bitter bondage and God heard their cry and sent Moses to deliver them? And oh, we're so prone to say, oh, it was so good back there, wasn't it? We forget the depression, the addiction. We forget the brokenness. And we're unwilling to make the, the break. And sometimes we're unwilling to even make the break from our achievements of the past. When God's telling us, we, we want to sit in our office and look at all our certificates on the wall and say, oh, what a wonderful person I am. And look at all the wonderful things that I've done. And the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3, and Pastor Tim mentioned this again on Sunday morning, all what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. He had a reputation, Paul. He, he was schooled among the best. He, he was a scholar. He, people would... I, as he walked down the street, people would say, there goes Paul. I mean, he himself declared that he was blameless concerning the law. There were not many, if any, that could even make that claim. Paul was saying, and I've actually fulfilled the law. He was extremely zealous for the things of God. And he had garnered, no doubt, a reputation. He had a brilliant mind, this man. And, and no doubt, people would notice him everywhere he went. But he said, those things I counted loss for Christ." Yea, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. You see, you can't start to hear the voice of the Son of God until you and I are willing to walk away from everything that we need to leave behind us. It's really that simple. You know, a lot of people, they want to keep those old relationships alive. You want to keep that old romance going when the person is not a believer in Christ and you know what the Word of God says. You want to keep that, that little, that you want that little sip of something that just makes you feel good on Saturday night and still want to go to church on Sunday and wonder why you can't hear the voice of God. There's so many things. You want that little peek on the internet at things that you shouldn't be looking at and wonder why you can't see or hear the voice of God. No, we have to be willing to be led away from even good things. Remember Peter said, it's good to be here. We have to be willing to be led away from even good things because the things that God has for us are better than the, our good things or the things we declare to be good. Now, lastly, just as Jesus did, in Matthew chapter 17, we must be willing to be led from spiritual experience to spiritual need. He could have stayed on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was God. 
he had Moses and Elijah with him. He's got his father speaking from heaven. He's got a, a small entourage, at least, of followers that he could teach. Could have stayed there forever. They could have just, for the rest of their lives, just said, Master, Master. But he had come for a mission. He had, at the top of the mountain was this wonderful spiritual experience. At the bottom of the mountain was a father crying out for a demon-possessed child. A child that was being thrown into the fire. A child that was being thrown into the water, a child that was being virtually destroyed by the powers that had a hold of him. And you think about our generation and what's happening to our children. The unbridled passion, the, un, the unmitigated confusion in all of their lives, the, the, the sense of hopelessness and anger that's getting a hold of, of this present generation. And we, you and I can live our Christian life just talking about old experience or we can follow Jesus and go down the mountain to where the human need really is. And that's exactly what happened in the book of Acts chapter two. They went from all of the places that they had been led by the spirit of God now into the upper room. And this, this is a marvelous experience. I mean, this is something that's been prophesied about by the prophets. This is, they're about to experience something that, that, the most profound prophets in the Old Testament only could dream about. The Spirit of God was about to fill every one of them. They were going to be given this explosive ability to communicate with people of other cultures and other languages. They could have just stayed in the upper room. They could have capped there. It was another transfiguration. May I say that? Because they were the ones now being transfigured by the Spirit of God. They, they, they could have just stayed there and spoken tongues to one another for the next five years. But you see, spiritual experience drew them because they're being led by the voice of God to spiritual need. Just outside of where they were, there was thousands of people coming from the temple, making, making great journeys to get there to, to, to try to worship God in the best way they knew how, even though it was deficient and short of redemption through the Son of God. And they walked out of that spiritual experience and went right into that mountain of spiritual need. And that's how the church was born. That's how the church was led all the way through the book of Acts. Remember the Paul the Apostle said, we wanted to go to Asia, but the Spirit of God said no. See, he had learned now to hear the voice of God. Peter learned to hear the voice of God. And the best thing that could ever happen to you and to me and to this present generation is that once again, we might learn to hear the voice of God. It affects the way we pray. If we hear the voice of God, we suddenly are, are coming in and it's not a one-way communication anymore with him. It's a two-way communication. We are putting our petitions or our concerns before God. Our ears are now open. He begins to speak to us. He tells us which way to go. Why? Because we've come to the end of ourselves. We are willing to walk away from old things that we need to walk away from. And we're willing to be led by him into the mountain of spiritual need that is part of our generation. I don't know about you, but I am unwilling to let this generation die on my watch. I am asking God, lead me. Lead me to where I need to go. Give me what I need to say. Walk with me, oh God. You, never, you don't send your servants out powerless. Help me to hear what you're saying. Help me to speak with you and for you so that you can move your hand once again as you always have throughout scriptural history and that you can bring glory to your own name. Give me the grace to abandon my ideas. My ideas are worthless. Give me the grace to abandon them. Give me the grace to recognize them. Give me the grace, Lord Jesus Christ, to be led by you and by you alone because your voice is the only voice that has the power to bring life out of death and light out of darkness and something out of nothing. Everything else is just a tabernacle on a mountaintop, something created by the hand of man. I want to close with this. When we talk about human need, Isaiah, the prophet, God said through Isaiah, 58, chapter 58, verse 6 and onward, is this not the fast that I've chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free? Is it not to break every yoke, to share your bread with the hungry, and you bring the poor who are cast out to your house? And when you see the naked, that you cover him, 
and, and not hide yourself from your own flesh. In other words, if, if your whole of religion is about yourself, you won't be able to hear the voice of God and your prayers will amount to nothing. But if you're willing to go with Jesus into this mountain of human need, as he did when he went down from the mountain of transfiguration and met with this man and his son and set this boy free, the promise is, then your light will break forth like the morning. Your healing will spring forth speedily. Your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, in other words, looking to blame somebody for the way things are in society today and speaking wickedness. I like the original King James. It just says empty talk. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you are willing to go where Jesus is leading you. That is the key. You have a choice now. You can camp on an old experience and die there. Literally, you can go to heaven, but you spiritually die in that old experience. Or you can just leave it and go where God is leading you now. And you watch what God will begin to do. You watch, you'll begin to hear his voice. Remember his promises. If you go into human need and don't hide from your own flesh. Don't hide from humanity, in other words, from people created in the image of God. If you go to them, you will say, Lord, speak to me, and he will say, here I am. Promises to give you light in darkness, water in seasons of drought, strength when strength is failing all around you. He promises to be a supply within you that will not fail. And here's a word for you. Here's a word for Times Square Church, if I may say so. Those that you will raise up in the future will build the old waste places. There'll be another generation brought to Christ. These sons and daughters that will be set free by the hand of God through a church that is not living on a past experience, but moving into what God has for them in the future. They will build the old waste places. I, I foresee young evangelists, pastors, teachers, preachers, godly men and women being raised up people who know the devil has lied to them, who will turn to God and, be, and radically begin to obey him, radically begin to follow him with all of their heart. And you will raise up the foundations of many generations, the foundations that have begun to crumble in our time, but through the power of God can easily be rebuilt again. And you will be called the repairer of the breach. In other words, the one who repaired the wall is in Nehemiah's day where the enemy was able to gain access. To the, to the society, to the culture. You will be called the one who repaired that breach, the one who restored our streets so that people can dwell in them again. This is the promise of God. But it all hinges on two words. Hear him. Hear him. If ever there was a day that we need to hear him, it's now. Now, one more time, for those that are listening online. If you are broken, you feel like a failure, you're wounded, you're bruised, you feel destroyed, you are the perfect candidate to be used by God. Get up from where you are and start to walk with him. And walk towards not just the healing that you need, that'll be, that'll be given you but walk towards the healing that somebody else needs. You don't have to have it all together to tell somebody else that God is good, that Jesus died for them. You can be dragging a wagon load of your own troubles behind you. You don't have to be perfect because it's not about you, it's about him. It's about what he did on the cross. We run into error when we think we have to be perfect 
to represent him, we don't. He perfects us. He takes us from where we are to where we need to go by the grace of Almighty God. He went to a cross. That's what this communion is about tonight. And on that cross, he bled and died and paid the price for our sin so that we can be reunited in a living relationship with God so that God could speak to us. God could live in us. God could guide us. God could manifest his glory through us. God could give us abilities to go places we could never go in our own strength and do things we could never hope to do and give us things we could never possess apart from him. He makes us into a people, the Bible says, who are wondered at. He makes us lights on a hill that cannot be hidden by his grace. But oh, my brother, my sister, hear him, hear him. You, you've come into this prayer meeting tonight and maybe you're looking for some, some dust to fall from heaven to cure your situation where all you have to do is hear the voice. of He will tell you what to do. You are his bride. I think the devil has beat on you long enough. It's time for you. He, he, he will show you the way to safety. He will show you the way to become productive in his kingdom and to actually rule and reign with him one day. By the grace of God, by the grace of God, let this be your day. The world needs the church now. The world needs the church. And you, my brother, my sister, are the bride of Christ. By the grace of Almighty God, get up and start walking with him. So Father, thank you tonight. Thank you for bringing to us to this communion table this evening. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that when you died, you brought us back into a living relationship with God and you gave us the promise of your Holy Spirit, the ability to be raised out of the power of death as you were and brought into the power of an endless life. Thank you, God, that your kingdom now resides with us and in us and through us. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for glorifying your name again through even the weakest of us, the weakest, like Peter, who walked away and cried bitterly and felt like a complete, utter, total failure. But he became one of the greatest saints of all time. Oh God, would you help us to hear this again? Would you help us, Lord, to turn away from our own ideas and our own sense even of what we should be and just let us, let you make us into what you desire us to be? Would you lead us in our weakness as the lepers once did in the Old Testament? You just led them back into the city with the good news that they'd found this great provision. They were still lepers and they went back to the city and they saved the city. God Almighty, help us to see things. Help us, Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you have your communion ready. And we're going to partake together. Everything that we need is in him. And if I may encourage you to do anything tonight, hear his voice. Hear his voice. He loves you. And everything he does is for your good. So don't be afraid to hear his voice. Let him lead you now. For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. You know, you know what the covenant is? I'm not going to fail you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm with you. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, 
You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you, Lord. What a pleasure it's been to pray with you tonight. You know, Pastor Tim, I'd like to do something a little different tonight if we can. If you wouldn't mind joining me and Pastor David as well, uh, if, if you could join with me. And I'd like to lay hands on this tablet.